Hi, I'm Sostein. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about how to make a house dress. So at the end of my Sleepy Hollow dress, I asked everyone to tell me about a dress they'd like to see me recreate. If I had been a betting woman, I would have bet that the number one request would have been either the red dress that Mina wears in Bram Stoker's Dracula or the red dress from Moulin Rouge. However, the one that was by far the most requested was the pinafore slash house dress I was wearing in the talky bits of the video. And wow, that was surprising. But that pleased me a lot because I actually made that dress myself and I'm quite proud of it. So first off, credit must be given where credit is due. That dress was heavily inspired by the dresses made by Little Women Atelier on Etsy. In fact, I still buy all my aprons, including this one, from there, and I highly recommend them for the dresses as well as the aprons, since it takes a lot less time, and honestly, it's about the same cost regardless. Then why do I make my own? I mean, it's a legit question. It's honestly because of comfort. A few months back, I decided to embrace the fact that I'm a simple country doctor and I decided to design house dresses for myself that made me look like a Ghibli character. I decided to call it Ghibli core and then I found out it was actually a real thing and it's called cottage core. So it's based on the simplistic styles worn by Sophie in Howl's Moving Castle as well as Ponyo from Ponyo. I want to embrace the Victorian school look, look, school girl look like the one that Alice wears in Alice in Wonderland. And one day while I was insomnia surfing Instagram at 3 a.m., I came across Little Women Atelier. Their dresses are adorable, with looks that are clearly based on 1860s gown, like completely, but they're cuter because they're shorter and they have pinafores, and they're all based on characters in Little Women. So I bought two along with a bunch of aprons and I honestly love them. I wanna first off say that I highly recommend them as a company. I think they make beautiful things out of great fabric and their craftsmanship is fantastic. There are a few downsides though. For instance, um, let me show you right here. So right here is my natural waist. I am actually taking the time to wear one of their dresses. So let me take off this apron and you can see really, really cute dress, right? Like look at that little ruffles and everything. And uh, however, their waist is up here. My natural waist is actually down here. If you look here, there's like, a three, four inch difference between my waist and their waist. And it's one thing that their waists are a little bit high waisted and it's a lot more high waisted than myself. And while they ask you for your waist size, um, they don't ask you for your high waisted size. So all the waists are a little bit too small on me, even though I put in about two inches of leeway when I gave in the measurements. Also, it doesn't button down completely. In fact, it buttons down to the waist and then there's a zipper right here. So it's just a little bit harder to get out of. And as someone who is on call a lot, I have to be able to get in and out of my dresses like this. Like I literally will get the phone call, I get out of my dresses, I change into scrubs and I run out the door. Moreover, as someone who has to do a lot of fittings at home for my costumes, getting in and out of clothing quickly is something that's really important to me. So that was a little bit more inconvenient and I wanted something that could get out of faster. So the very first time I made this dress was not actually for that reason. I didn't know any of this at the time. I just knew that there was a three month wait list for the dress and I wanted it stat. So I wanted my cottage core slash Ghibli core life to start as soon as possible. And so I just kind of made it myself and um, I still buy all my aprons from there because their aprons are perfect. Um, and if an apron is a little high waisted, who really cares? It's an apron. You can just tie it however you want. So. I love their aprons so much and I highly recommend aprons for daily use. I don't know if you know this, I have a two year old toddler and he gets into messes constantly. Having a giant paper towel that I am wearing at all times that is machine washable, tumble dry and just gets softer with every wash is incredible. Moreover, it protects the dress so I don't have to wash the dress as frequently. Again, I'm not going to go into how to make the aprons here because I'm just going to link that because I don't make my own aprons. I just buy them. Let's get started. 
So to start with, the pattern I'm using is truly Victorian's 1860s work dress. In case you couldn't tell from the name Little Women Atelier, the dresses are clearly based on the 1860s. You can tell from the drop sleeves as well as the bishop sleeves and the way that they have little like pleats and everything in the bust. Per truly Victorian form, the pattern fit perfectly. As usual, I always recommend making a mock-up first. Now this dress does have several views. I ignored views both A and view B and only use the lining pieces. I got my linen from fabricstores.com and they have a truly fantastic selection of linens. I also would recommend using Mood as well as other places such as Burnley and Trowbridge and I'll link all those below. You will need five yards if you want to do my version. Um, my version uses a lot of fabric. So first I cut out the bodice front as well as the bodice back and the side back pieces and assembled those per the directions. Of, of course, I would like to say that I extended the front bodice a few inches because one, I want to make this a little bit more looser fitting. And secondly, I wanted my version to include a button center float closure and wanted the front lining to extend to the back. Using my baby lock soprano, I sewed the whole bodice together. The darts were sewn, then knotted, then ironed towards the sides. The back seams were all clipped and ironed open. I did this twice, once for the outside shell and one for the lining. Then I got the sleeve pattern and cut it out. I did modify the sleeve pattern by shrinking the height and the width so I could cut out the two sleeves per fabric width and thus save fabric. It's a house dress. I don't mind if the sleeves are, are not quite as puffy as intended. Moreover, I did shorten it because the original pattern brings the sleeves down to the wrists and for me personally, I find a three quarter sleeve far more useful. Now, I did take a moment to sew nine pin tucks on each sleeve head about seven inches from the top on each side. Then I sewed the sleeve edges together, serged the inside seam since the sleeves unlike the bodice will not be aligned. I then gathered up the bottom edge of the sleeve and sewed it right side together to the armband. Note that I did have to increase the width on my armband because as I mentioned, instead of going all the way to my wrist, mine will sit at the three quarters mark. I had already ironed the half inch seam allowance on the outside of the armband. I then folded the armband in half inward so that it would cover the raw edge of the sleeve fabric within and sewed this shut. Normally I do this by hand, but I wanted to see how well the stitch in the ditch technique would work. So I tried that. It actually worked very well. Once the sleeves were both finished, I then attached it to the bodice along the bottom. Right sides together, I sewed the bottom six inches of the sleeve to the dress without ruffles. I then gathered up the sleeve and then sewed it to the sleeve head with the machine. Meanwhile, I had drafted my own Peter Pan collar pattern and used that to make an interface collar. I sewed the collar together, clipped the edges, ironed it, then flipped it right side out in order to make the collar. I sewed this to the exterior of the jacket, just a shell, and then hand turned the edges of the lining to cover the raw edges again. Now that that was done, I carefully lined up the bodice lining to the exterior of the garment, wrong sides together. I pinned the two together, being extra careful to make sure all the seams met up. For the armholes, I hand turned the seam allowance of the lining to cover the raw edges of the sleeve head. For the front of the dress, I actually put on some iron-on interfacing to the front two and a half inches of the bodice along where the buttonholes would go. This is my third time making the dress. I know that the buttonholes and the button area tends to go limp with lots of washing. So having a little bit of reinforcement like iron-on interfacing is really helpful to keep it kind of stabilized and let it keep its shape. I then sat for about two episodes of The Crown, and with a healthy dose of Bernadette and costume drama, I then sewed the whole thing together. Now it was time to add the waistband. I sewed on the waistband by putting the entire bodice piece front to the waistband piece and sewing it on by machine. I then ironed it open and then folded it to put a fold at the very bottom and turn the inside half edge over. I cleaned it all up with neat hand stitching. I do want to mention that I'm intentionally making this dress quite big on around the waist. I normally have a 26 inch waist, but for this dress, I'm making my waist about 30 inches around so that there is room for a large meal or just a lot of movement. Now that the bodice was completely done with all raw edges either surged or covered with other fabric, it was time for the skirt to be attached. Now, just a heads up, the skirt is huge. My skirt is actually about 160 inches all the way around. So to do this, I cut the skirt length three fabric widths wide. 
One of these I left intact, for the other two I cut in half. I did cut a wedge out of two of the pieces, um, about six inches at the top, so that I would remove some of the bulk from the waist while leaving some of the fullness around the bottom of the skirt. I then searched all the cut edges, then I attached the pockets to the front and the back. Meanwhile, I sewed the wedge half of the skirt to the back, the bias going against the skirt selvages. This way, the bias cut portion will be stabilized by the straight portion of the back. Then I ironed all the seams open. If this sounds confusing, please pause and refer to this drawing I did to try and explain it. Then I sewed the back to the front, going all the way around the pocket. It's kind of funny, you start at the very top of the skirt, and you stitch going down, and then you hit the pocket, and you go around the pocket, and then once you're around the pocket and you hit the skirt again, you go straight downwards and then seam the rest of the skirt together. It's nutty, but it works. It makes a really nice and clean pocket, and you have a pocket. Then I fold the front edge of the skirt, where the buttons would go, and the top 5 8 inch along the top of the already serged skirt piece. Now the skirt was ready to add to the bodice. To do this, I preferred to do this by hand using cartridge pleating. Cartridge pleating was very popular in the 1860s, but the real reason I do it is because it looks really good and it adds a lot of fabric to a very small piece. So gathering down 160 inches of skirt to 30 inches of skirt is actually quite doable. Using two strong pieces of Guterman's quilting thread, I did two parallel wide running stitches about a quarter inch from the folded edge and five eighths of an inch from the same folded edge. Please note that the in and out points of all the stitches are roughly parallel to each other so that when you fold, pull them together, you get these nice cartridges. And it's not exact, like some people actually make sure that they're exactly parallel, like every single stitch. I myself do not do that, it's called stitch counting. I do do it for certain things. This is a house dress, I am not gonna do it for this. I just kinda eyeball it. And then using a double threaded piece of silk thread, heavily waxed, I pick up a few threads from the top of each cartridge pleat and then sew them to the very bottom um, of the bodice that is has that fold on it that's very clean. I keep the pleats fairly close to each other since there will be a lot of them. I'd say it takes me about an hour and 15 minutes for each quarter of the skirt. So the whole skirt together took me about six hours. Just a heads up, every couple of stitches on the cartridge pleat, I make a point of putting a knot in my thread um, and then kind of burying that knot and moving on. The reason for that is my kid has this tendency to drag me around by pulling my skirt and it's really adorable so I haven't been discouraging him from doing that but it does mean that there is a certain section of the skirt that always tears before other pieces. It's been repaired twice on all of my gowns now. And it's really easy to repair because instead of the whole skirt falling off, only that little section of stitches will come out. I figured out where to put my buttonholes by using my awesome buttonhole tool that my friend Asta Darling on Instagram introduced me to. It's actually called the Simplex Sewing Gauge. I know I want there to be five buttons on the bodice front from the neck to the waist, so I stretch out the sim gauge until the distance from the neck to the waist has exactly five buttonholes in it and mark those with my chalk pen. I then mark the three buttonholes below that as well since I know that I want this dress to have eight buttons in total. After that, I use my Baby Lock Soprano to make the buttonholes. In general, I find their buttonhole system to be the easiest of all machines and the most dependable. I got eight very clean looking buttonholes by the end of it. I then hammered these open using a hammer and the clover buttonhole cutting tool. As usual, I will link all these tools below for those of you who find all of this mind-blowing and must have it in your life. After this, I marked the button placement using a friction marker, which disappears with heat, and then sewed my buttons in. For those of you wondering, I hand covered each button mold, a bone button shape with spare bits of linen by hand. I find that these button molds are stronger than any machine button shank personally, which is why I do it this way. After this, uh, along the front, I sewed the front bottom edge together. Then I figured out the length I wanted by trying it on and putting it on my Beatrice dress form and then marking the hem. I ironed the hem where I wanted it and then turned the inside edge over to clean the, up the edge. Then I machine sewed this with silk and the dress was completely done. I then put the apron on, but notice that this particular batch of aprons was a little longer than my last few. It's it's weird. Um, like I literally bought the same three aprons in the same size in three different colors, and they're all different lengths. And that's fine. It's fine. But um, I did want my white 
the apron to be a little shorter. I wanted it so that the bottom edge of the green was just peeking below it. So I sewed in a few pin tucks by ironing the bottom edge and sewing a half inch seam from the fold. I opened this, pushing the fold downwards. It needed a second pin tuck and then I put the second pin tuck one and a half inch above the last one using the same method. And now my newest Kotchkor dress outfit was done. This one has to be the fastest get ready with me ever. I simply put it on over whatever underwear I may choose to wear that day. Off, I want to emphasize how comfortable and breathable these dresses are. They're machine washable, they you know they wipe down, you can do whatever you want with them because they're really like heavy and thick linen. Easy on, easy off, they just kind of fit my lifestyle really well. And they have so many pockets guys, like the pockets are so useful. Oh my god, I love them. So the great thing about this dress is how many outfits it looks good with. Like you can mix and match it with different aprons. Like I think pink and green go great together personally. So I really like the way that looks. And the white aprons like really clean and crisp and super ghibli, which I really like. And on the other hand, if you put on the brown one, it's just a lot more practical and yet it has like this really autumnal air that I really like. Um, not to mention, if you're a mom and you don't have at least one brown apron the color of poop, you are lying to yourself. This is my Ghibli core slash cottage core dress. I'm not really sure which one I'm going to continue calling it, but I'm kind of leaning towards Ghibli core because I really do feel like it encompasses the feel. And while I am wearing American Duchess shoes with them, because if I'm gonna be wearing like this historically inspired history bounding dress, I am absolutely gonna be wearing history shoes as well. And these are Regency Manchester's, but I feel like any shoes can do. Nonetheless, um, there is a, the spirit of the dress, which is like this carefree notion. So running around barefoot, I think is the absolute best way to wear this dress because it just conjures up images of Ghibli characters running through fields barefoot oh, and playing with Totoro in the middle of the night. Like that is the magic of Ghibli, right? And that's kind of the feeling I want to capture when I'm at home playing with my kids. So love this dress. I will absolutely be making more. I think my next project is going to be Sophie's dress from Howl's Moving Castle except as a history bounding house dress. So that one will be my next project. It probably will not be on my channel for a little bit, but um, please subscribe, stick around, and we'll make more awesome stuff. Like that's what we do here. Thanks for watching guys.